Artificial intelligence, robotics, virtual reality will change the way we work, learn and play. If you want to know more about it, please stay with us. Festival, three weeks long and online open access event where we talk about changing economy, innovations and new technologies. Speaking of new technologies, uh, we'll be focused exactly on them today. We'll look at the new trends and we'll try to answer the questions how they will affect our work and how the, the, the way we communicate and how we interact with them. For these sessions, we will be joined by uh, Sophie Hackford, future thinker and previous director of Wired Consulting. But we, before we start, I'd like to encourage our audience to participate in this discussion and send us a questions via Twitter using the hashtag thinkdiff or in the chat below this video using diff account. Hey, Sophie, it's uh, great to have you here with us. Thank you for joining. Well, thank you for inviting me. So, Sophie, as we said, the technology is changing. Uh, that's fact. Uh, but what actually it, does it mean for us and how we should prepare for that and what we should know about it? Sure. Well, I think, I think firstly, we actually don't spend enough time thinking about the technologies that are defining the future. And that's one of my sort of big frustrations, but also one of my driving sort of forces, I guess, of, of what I've been doing over the last 10 years or so. I think it's because it's easy to think that, that the future is some sort of I don't know, a luxury to think about that, you know, we've got so many things that we need to firefight today, your business or your lives or your, you know, are the robots going to take your jobs or whatever it is. It's actually easy to think that that's a luxury rather than something we should really prioritize. And I, I think if I, if I just show you a couple of, of images, if we think about the autonomous vehicle, for example, this is Uber's um, autonomous uh, taxi that currently is already running in, in Pittsburgh in the US. You know, this was a dream. 10 years ago, and now suddenly it's a reality. And I think that's something that we need to think about is how quickly this stuff happens. Or if you take this tweet by Elon Musk a couple of uh, um, uh, months ago, you know, if you'd read this tweet 10 years ago, it would have seemed like a fantasy. It would have seemed like science fiction. But of course, the private space industry is a reality today in, in the way that we couldn't even imagine back and then. On that note, Sophie, actually, that's very fascinating and how our acceptance to this new technology is changing. Yeah. Uh, exactly. And I, as, I, as I always say, you know, we're often not surprised enough, I think, by these technologies. They become so, uh, I suppose, important and, and central to our lives so quickly that we actually we don't question them that much. And as I was um, saying to you only, only a few minutes ago, the mobile phone, of course, is the perfect example of this, something that is hugely powerful that we carry around in our pockets every day with us, which actually, if you'd told us 10 years ago, we would carry a surveillance device in our pockets that followed our, our every whim, uh, predicted our every move, we would have thought you were completely crazy. And yet now it seems completely normal and in fact, rather distressing if you don't have it on you at all times. And, and where are we going with this? I mean, like, where are we going with this technology? You said exactly sure. uh, this, this uh, a couple of years ago, we wouldn't be, you know, expecting to have uh, some uh, uh, phones in our packets for now. It's obvious we have them. And where are we going with this? Sure. Well, the first thing I wanted to talk about um, with you guys is, is about the, the idea that we're actually going to be talking to the internet, um, talking to artificial intelligence rather than just using the internet as a reference tool. And that's my first topic that I wanted to cover, which was that apps like WeChat, uh, which is the one that's on the on the screen now, or Facebook Messenger, are all actually AI platforms, basically. There are, there are platforms that we're going to be asking questions of Jamie Oliver, asking questions of Selfridges, asking questions of Ford. Um, as, as companies and have AIs responding uh, to us rather than sort of a human platform. And, and I think this is all going to be driven by voice interfaces. So uh, I'd like to talk just a little bit about that because I think it's super interesting. I also think we're going to be moving beyond the keyboard. You know, for the last 15 years or so, when we wanted something from the internet, we just typed a, an instruction into a keypad. Um, and as Google and Amazon know very well, things like this, the Amazon Echo is the first, I suppose, baby steps 
into having voice um, as the primary method of communicating with information with the internet. And that's this is Amazon's Echo platform, just super quickly, and then, I'll, and then I'd love to talk with you more about it. You basically say to it, um, hello, Alexa. Alexa is the, 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 the AI that lives inside this Echo box, which is about, I suppose, about this, this tall, about the size of a shoebox or something. You say, oh, you know, what are my investments doing today? What's the weather like outside? Can you book that restaurant that I was um, you know, looking up a couple of weeks ago? Can you book my train tickets? All of these things we used to have to type in to Google or to Amazon or whatever else are now uh, something we're going to be able to order um, and, and do with voice. Yeah, and exactly. That's that's what is already happening, right? We can see yeah. Amazon and now already also Google who's introducing exactly. this. Could you please tell us exactly. a little bit more about that? Sure. And this is the Google Home um, speaker right here. And as uh, as Jeff Bezos says, the CEO of Amazon, we're just at the tip of the iceberg with these kind of technologies. This is just, the, as, as I said earlier, the baby steps towards what Google's slightly creepingly calling the transition um, to voice, which I think is a really exciting uh, moment. And as you'll see, the Google um, uh, speaker that, you, that, again, you have in your home um, is something that they're anticipating is going to be the next iteration of search. You know, Previously, we'd look to search as something to find information. Now, as I said, we're going to be conversing or talking to Google rather than typing information into a keyboard. And I think that's a, a really important factor that we haven't really kind of thought that much about and what it even means for us. And in and fact, if you look at this quote here from Google, they say it's as important as Google launching search back in the day. And given that search is quite a big part of their business, um, they have obviously very high ambitions for it. Yeah, and exactly. That's uh, that's wonderful how we kind of can see this change, right? I mean, like yeah. that we interact actually with the machines, with new technology, and we're talking to them and like getting a little bit more personal. Absolutely. Yeah, and what I'm quite excited about actually, if you, if you take it one step further than that, so... At the moment, obviously, your Google um, box or the Amazon box that sits in your house um, only listen to the words that you're saying. But it won't be long, I'm sure, before it's the tone of the voice that you use, the emotions in your voice, indeed, the emotions on your face as this platform here um, on the screen now um, shows you. Emotion recognition by technology is definitely going to be um, a big trend over the next few years. Apple, Apple just bought a company called Emotion. Um, Emotion, again, looks at the micro expressions of your face. We might think, therefore, that the robots or that your Siri or your Google Maps or whatever responds to you slightly differently, depending on how you're feeling um, and what your emotions are. I think that's a very interesting next step on from that. And in fact, I saw this recently. This is from Superflux. Um, they kind of put together, it's, it's, I think it's a bit of a, a fake or a joke, but the idea is that it's, a, it's a, a flying billboard, a sort of billboard drone that advertises relevant to who's around it how they're feeling, what gender they are, the age, what their, what their facial expression looks like when they're looking at, at advertising. I think this precision of response driven by artificial intelligence is really gonna, is gonna change the way that we speak to the machines, to the internet, to robots, to drones, um, however. Yeah, and that's on that on that point, we have a question from uh, Mary Belfast. Uh, what uh, effect will the transition to voice have on co-working and office spaces, like our interaction with the machines? And you know, Absolutely. at the moment, we are using uh, online conference, and maybe in future you will be here virtually in three D. Uh, would you like to talk about it? A little bit Absolutely, more. And, and I want to talk a little bit later about virtual reality because I think it's, it's very important. But if we, if we just come to that, that, that point, and thanks for the question, um, I think it's going to be very noisy. I mean, if you could imagine lots of people screaming at their machines rather than uh, typing instructions into them, I think with, you know, Google and Amazon and others are going to have to think about what that's going to look like. And clearly in a train carriage, we can't be all screaming at our, our mobiles either for instructions or for, for, for you know, what we're looking to, to achieve from them, because clearly that's not going to be practical. So I think there's going to be, a, like all these things, a bit of a bumpy road to try and establish what the protocols are around doing this sort of thing. But I do also think that it is going to completely change the way that we interact with the machines. And given that that's you know, the big economic driver of the next few years, I think these technologies that we use at home are inevitably going to sort of leak into the office or into a kind of business environment. I also think it's going to make customer expectations incredibly high. You know, when you, as it often happens to me, when you text your bank, when they've texted you and it says, do not reply to this number, you think, well, why the hell do you text me then? You know, <laughs> this, this kind of one way thing doesn't work in our minds because we assume that that's just a platform that we can interact with. And I think we're going to expect from a consumer perspective, from a, from a client perspective, from a citizen perspective even, that smart services, maybe from the government or whatever else, should be able to respond to us personally. And it says, oh, Sophie, we're sorry, your boiler's not working, you know, or 
Sophie, thank you for applying for that loan. You haven't been you know, approved on this occasion or whatever else. And then AI will be the one responding to me in that messaging or that voice format and not, not a human. Yeah. Like I would like to just come back quickly on on uh, on uh, this uh, what uh, still we can see on the screen. Um, like, is it also something about being more more tailored in terms of advertisement and yeah, like yeah. Lo looking through you know kind of as I said before personalizing uh, the advertising advertisement and like making more personal and uh, making more tailored to the to the to the audience. Absolutely, and I think we can expect everything to be tailored specifically to us. They call it the kind of audience of one. So in the previous time, you were able to scale lots of information to obviously to lots of, of people and, and we're moving into an era where, you know, that, that can be personalized specifically to you, to your buying habits, to your, you know, whatever technology setup you've got at home, to your car, to whatever it is. I think that's one of the big drivers of AI. And in fact, if I can talk a little bit about AI, I think it's really um, important um, to, because I think uh, if I just skip to this, this section here, we are going to see a lot of this. As I said, it's impossible to personalize things in the way that, that we might imagine in the future without using artificial intelligence. And, and I'd, I'd like, if you don't mind, just to talk a little bit about that. So yeah, yeah please go ahead. Important drivers of change over the next um, few years. And I think one of the biggest questions that I have is that given that from low Earth orbit, um, from the satellites that are being flung up there at a great rate, um, to sensors being everywhere, to whatever we're seeing, this explosion of data that's going to be pouring out of everything from our jackets that are smart to our phones to our, to our satellites to whatever else and we're going to what we can know about the world and about ourselves is going to completely change it's going to become incredibly precise and incredibly tailored and using things like satellites or like this is a dna sequencer from a company called oxford nanopore that i that i've um, i've actually got one of these myself now and this is a handheld device that can actually sequence any genetic or biological information and give you, you know, the result. What is this? Is this a bit of, uh, I don't know, um, grass or a cow DNA or whatever it might be, or, you know, Ebola or whatever it is that you're, you're looking for. Now, why am I talking about all this in terms of artificial intelligence? Well, given that this explosion of data is not going to be looked at and reviewed by humans, it's going to have to be, you know, collated and synthesized or analyzed by AI. And I think that's really important for us to do in lots of different areas because we've created this enormous problems for ourselves. If we think of a company like Sentient AI, Sophie. for example, Sophie, oh, yes, sorry. sorry, sorry. Just on that note, quickly, um, mm -hmm. you know, because like probably uh, a lot of people will ask, like, what about security? Like, we are giving, yeah, you know, uh, our uh, personal data DNA to some device. Like, mm -hmm. what about security? Could you please a little bit talk about this as well? Absolutely. And I think, like all these things, I think we are going into rather uncertain times in terms of uh, security. We already know how difficult it is to secure our bank data um, and other personal information about ourselves. And I don't think it's going to get a great deal easier, in, certainly in the short term. But it, it is, like all these things, very important that we do so because the upside of a lot of these technologies is so great. So if we think about the big challenges that we've created for ourselves, whether that's disease analysis, whether it's climate change, whether it's financial uh, instability in some global financial system or whatever, we can't solve these problems by ourselves. You know, we need AI, we need some sort of super intelligence to help us solve these problems, certainly in time anyway. And if we look at um, a, a company, and I will come back to your, your point in a minute, but if you look at a company like, like Sentient, for example, they now have AIs that will read your, your vitals in hospital every 125 milliseconds. So that the cases of sepsis in that hospital in Mass Gen in, in Massachusetts have gone down by 95%. Now, it's, as I said, difficult to weigh up the security of that data versus the enormous benefit that it brings to society. And that, I think, is going to be the kind of constant debate over the next few years is there's this amazing technology being created that we don't want to we don't want to try and limit its potential but at the same time we've got to offset the challenges that come with that of course some of which are regulatory and are to do with ethics yes yeah, sophie just jump on that um quickly uh, one thing mm -hmm. like there is a huge debate at the moment you know like how uh, artificial intelligence will influence our our jobs and like a huge debate uh, like that uh, we will lose our jobs but i would like not to talk about it I would like to talk about actually opportunities, like what kind of jobs yeah. we, it will be created that we, at the moment, we are not expecting to have. Because that's yeah. what is more uh, interesting than talking about 
that, oh, okay, artificial intelligence will take over our jobs. Now let's not talk about it, but let's talk about opportunities. Absolutely. And I think, I mean, I'm an optimist and I, I appreciate there are a lot of challenges coming our way in terms of, of skilling up. For me, it's not about jobs, it's really about skills. Yeah. Um, you know, there will be enough jobs. It's, it's uh, have we got the skilled people to be able to work in them? And so I wish that we talked more about skills when we talked about the jobs evaporating. And I think like you, I see a, a tremendous amount of opportunity. Like if we take this sepsis example and the, and the AI that takes your vitals every 125 milliseconds, now, clearly, that, that takes up part of the role of a nurse, a human nurse, who would have done that previously. However, I don't want to lie in hospital and be administered with drugs and everything else just by a machine. You know, I'm a human. I'd like another human to be in the equation somewhere, um, if only, you know, to provide a more human experience for me. Now, on top of that, I think that not only will the role, roles therefore evolve, I think also we will look for skills that involve us being able to work with the machines. So I always say what makes me rather a challenging customer, because I'm someone who always thinks about um, the next few years, is that I don't want to go to a doctor, for example, just on their own without access to incredible AI, but neither do I want to just go to an AI. I want this incredible mixture of man and machine to, to solve my whatever medical problem that I present um, to that physician. And I think that's the challenge, is to build the skills between the two, because then I think we could have a tremendous set of opportunities across every single business. And as I said, it's, it's, it's easy to get trapped in that sort of robots taking our jobs um, debate, which is really, really pulling, putting down a lot of uh, headlines in the, in the last few, few years, rightly. But I do think, as I said, it's more, it's more about skills. We have, a, we have a quick question from Betty mm. um, on uh, the technologies and um, how these new technologies will be more accessible for everyone, like for people in Africa, for um, you know, uh, emerging markets. Uh, you mentioned uh, WeChat which is yeah. uh, very popular in China and in Asia in general, but how these new technologies will be, will be available in, in, uh, and accessible, most importantly, um, well, in, in the poorer countries. Absolutely, and I think one of the, um, one of the great uh, thinkers on a lot of this stuff is a guy called Professor Ian Golden at Oxford, who I used to work for, and he wrote a book very recently um, that is about the idea that we're moving into this new renaissance, and I'm, I'm coming to a point, I promise, that one of the reasons is that we might be moving into a moment of great artistic and architectural um, flourishing because we're going to have more time as humans to be more human because the technology will do a lot of our, our jobs. And of course, that's a, that's a sort of bit of a utopian view. But the other point is that the Renaissance, the original Renaissance, which was basically this coming together of you know, people from around the world and converging on cities in Europe, led to a huge sort of explosion of creativity. And I think I see the same in principles happening across uh, different parts of the world where people who have been previously excluded from being able to better themselves, uh, either pull themselves out of poverty or join the kind of economic um, uh, class, are going to be able to be able to do that through cheap technology. And of course, technology gets cheaper you know, every moment practically and more powerful due to Moore's law. And that means that, as I said, people who haven't been able to access, you know, information, knowledge, the internet, commerce, uh, have a bit of a fast track relative um, to how they would have done maybe 20 or 30 years ago. And I think WeChat is a perfect example uh, of that. Yeah, and like vi variety of uh, different services which uh, WeChat is providing, right? Um, exactly. Like you have... Uh, so it's, a it's a splendid platform and in fact, you know, if you look at what Facebook is trying to do with Facebook Messenger, it's almost a complete copy and paste um, of what WeChat does. And they've, they've almost admitted that themselves. What's fascinating about that to me is really, I think, that's the first time that a Western tech company has admitted to be to copying um, a Chinese company's product. Um, yeah, and that's right. a really, I think, amazing sort of tipping point moment that we'll be looking for creativity and innovation, not just from the markets we traditionally look at, like Silicon Valley or New York or, or Hong Kong, but actually to places um, which perhaps aren't, haven't been on the innovation map up until now. Well, that's, you know, that's the kind of thing that, uh, as we said, with the technologies we were not expecting 10 years uh, ago where we exactly. will get there, but actually with also the places which are appearing, we are not expecting exactly. today and, and they are popping up like China. We wouldn't say like 10, 15 years ago that China is such a strong, um, like technologically placed, but now it's you have so many centers, uh, re research centers in, uh, in there. Yeah, well, I, I mean, of course, you've had 40 years of, of incredibly complicated and um, 
uh, uh, sophisticated manufacturing happening in that country with a billion people. You know, it's almost inevitable that the innovation that comes from that incredible skill set, that incredible set of global contacts that those those people have, are able to start actually doing really creative and interesting things. I just got back um, from Shenzhen actually, where this incredible hotbed of innovation. Um, I think it is a city with the most millionaires in China, and it's where all the hardware is made, basically around the world. It's like ground zero for hardware globally, and it's uh, it's a pretty exciting place to be right now. Yeah, definitely. While announcing this this session, I was talking about like how this new technology will uh, influence our our work, but also how it in, it will influence the way we we play, we have fun. Could you please sure. talk about this a little bit more? Absolutely. I'm going to do it in the context of virtual reality, if you don't mind. So I'm just going to skip um, to this slide and, and, and kick off here. Um, so I'm very excited about um, virtual reality, and I think. Although it is going to have a tremendous impact on how we play, I think it will also have an impact on everything else too. And I hope that uh, some of these slides might help to, to, to get the debate going on that. Um, so I call virtual reality teleportation, which is a bit of a kind of uh, um, a controversial thing to say, I suppose, given it's such a sort of science fiction kind of word. But actually, I've seen some truly spectacular stuff that genuinely makes you feel like you've been teleported somewhere. And, and I'll, I'll talk a bit about that now. So I'm lucky to be able to play with lots of these new tools. This is a, a headset called uh, Microsoft's HoloLens, like which you. actually puts, <laughs> it's a bit like a, um, uh, a, bit, a bit like Pokemon. It puts digital information or digital imagery onto the real world, but in a really quite compelling way. And I'm going to um, show you a video now, if we could just play it. Yep. As a guy um, who is able to, to sort of bring uh, his daughter, who's in a separate room to him, into the same room as, as him and have a conversation with her. And uh, I'm sure, as you can see, that it's uh, that it's playing now. That you can see that this is actually a pretty extraordinary experience. This, uh, to me, yeah, yeah, yeah. Is we, what? We, we are we are working on that video at the moment. Uh, so oh, yeah. okay, it's not quite playing it. Well, anyway, what I think is really exciting. Would you let me know when it plays? Uh, yeah, I'll let you know. Thank you. So what I'm excited about is is the ability not just to have these amazing virtual experiences on your own, but to be able to bring other people um, into those experiences with you. And I think that's a really compelling thing. I don't think virtual reality is going to be very exciting for people unless it's a social experience, because most people like to do things um, with their friends, with their family, um, and whatever else. And I think the video is playing. I can see it in the background. Yeah, we have the video at the moment, yeah. So as I said, this is an extraordinary um, uh, video as far as I'm concerned, because it shows a consumer product that's available today that enables you, as I said, to basically teleport people into uh, your, the room with you. And if we could skip to the next one, which is to the end of this same video, um, we'll see that he's actually able then to replay that experience. He is re-watching the memory, essentially, of something that he had done, including his daughter. He obviously, as, as you can see here, thought it was a bit bulky to watch in real life size, so he's put it down to his coffee, coffee table size so he can watch it in a slightly smaller way. But isn't that extraordinary? Isn't that an amazing thing that, you know, I would be hard pushed um, to say would be happening in the, in the you know, this early in, in sort of 2016. Um, and that's what I'm pretty excited about. And that's why I think that a lot of people, and I'm just going to skip to the next slide now, call virtual reality and augmented reality the most social of social media. It's going to be even more social if you can imagine it, than Instagram or Facebook um, or any of those things. And I think that's a really uh, exciting concept. And if I could play one more video now, just yes. before we have a discussion about this, yeah, sure. what is also re really important to understand about virtual reality and augmented reality to a degree is that they're actually, they fool your brain into thinking you're actually experiencing that thing as opposed to watching it. And I think, I don't want to be playing the swarming drones right now, so if yeah, you could just it's, pause that one. Yeah, we can see it now. I, I, that's not the video I want to, to be watching. It's what it's a, a video with a snooker player. So if you just zoom back about four slides, that would be great. Um, and what I'm excited about is that the the impact that that has on your brain is really really compelling. It basically makes you feel like you're not just watching an experience, like in in the cinema or at the movies. You're actually feeling like you're experiencing that thing yourself. Are we having a little bit of trouble finding it? It doesn't look like that that way. Yeah, sorry. I mean, like we have some troubles with that with the videos, but um, this is not the one we we wanted to to look at. No, uh, it's not. But it doesn't matter. Yeah. Don't worry about it. Yeah. Um, it it should be, as I said, it should be after after that one, and it should have a man playing snooker. Anyway, what's really important, as I said about it, is this idea that we are um, we are becoming when we're watching virtual reality not just um, the uh, spectator, but we actually become part of the story. Um, and the video that I wanted to show you, which I'll just describe super quickly, it's actually very amusing. 
it's the snooker player Rory O'Sullivan taking a um, a pot in or whatever the expression is. Sorry about my snooker knowledge. Um, in uh, in virtual reality, and he te- he goes to take um, the, the 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 shot, and as he does so, he he thinks he's playing snooker so compellingly that he actually falls over because he thinks that he can lean on the table to carry on playing the shot. And that's why, as I said, it's so important that even a professional snooker player can be so convinced that that's what they're actually in that real experience that, that you know, they can, they can literally fall over whilst, whilst they're doing it. And as I said, when we become the subjects of the story, when we become part of that experience, so instead of watching Harry Potter in the cinema, you'll, he'll be sitting next to you on the sofa and having a conversation with you. That's when it starts becoming really interesting. And I think that's, that's where virtual reality is going. On that note, like uh, at the moment, we still see, you know, uh, this big glasses. Um, yeah. I have to say personally that it's not looking very, uh, you know, uh, interesting for me. I cannot imagine myself like walking around all the time with the glasses. Like, but I, I understand that it's just the very beginning, and that will probably, yeah. you know, move on very fast. Yes, exactly. And I, I always try and get people to think back to, you know, to the 80s when you kind of carried, or even the early 90s, when you were carrying around a mobile phone and you had to kind of pull up the, the antenna and you couldn't really hear anything, you had to hang out the window to try and get reception. And yeah. now if you think about how we, how we, it's such a seamless part of our life, and I said we'll be talking to the computers soon, you could, if you try and imagine the same trajectory with these, you know, these headsets are the mobile phones of the 80s in terms of the equivalent of, of where they are in their in their in their emergence and, and their and their kind of technology and every day the technology gets bit it gets smarter it gets faster and I think that we will have that not just if you think about Pokemon as well it's just a very good example of how that what it isn't just about disappearing down into a virtual world on your own this will in fact augment the world augment the world we already know and, and the Hololens that that headset that the guy is wearing when he was talking to his daughter in that 3D um, experience, they think that actually we'll be able to use that at work as well. So that the documents, in fact, the team, apparently Microsoft team already do this. But the documents that you would usually have on your laptop or in your on your desktop will be documents, a bit like Minority Report, you know, that you'll be able to interact with. And they've said that productivity, they think, is going to be much, much better when you're able to, to interact with the documents that you're working on in more of a 3D uh, way. Of course, you could imagine doctors um, using that. They already use those, those headsets on the International Space Station, um, so you could get training on, on certain, or, or some engineering help on certain you know, problems that are, that are happening on, on the space station or whatever. So I just, it, it, for me, it's just the, it's day one. It's day one of the story of, of virtual and augmented reality. Sophie, we will continue this discussion. Let me just make a, a short break here. We will um, go to Joey, my uh, my friend from uh, from from the foundation. Joe is uh, head of uh, higher education, and she will talk about uh, what next uh, in terms of technology in DIF. Joey. Hi, thank you, Lucas, um, and welcome everybody. Um, well, I was at the DIFF Live launch um, on uh, Monday where the uh, technical um, evangelist, uh, Robert Scoble, was teasing us with a statement that he'd seen the future of technology and it was going to blow our minds. And after listening to what Sophie's uh, been saying, then I can really believe it. Um, he was in uh, conversation with the author and broadcaster, P- uh, Paul Mason, and social strategist, Dickie Silvestri, and they were talking about the impact that digital technology may have have on society and the economy. So this is a great compliment to what Sophie's uh, talking about. So a definite catch up uh, session for those people uh, that are interested in this. And staying on the topic of digital technology, don't forget that we have um, our digital uh, interactive graphics, which you can take part in around disruptive technologies that we believe are going to have a significant influence in the future. Um, You can access these um, uh, graphics through the website that you're on now. Uh, So join us and take part in that um, conversation. Something later on today, coming up at seven o'clock, the Wood Wide Web, that's something I'm definitely not going to miss because we often talk about uh, digital technologies and the power of the networks that they create. But Nate has been doing this for millennia and um, Professor uh, Simard from uh, uh, the uh, Columbia University from MySpace. is um, uh, coming to join us. Um, she's going to tell us about um, the power of plants and trees. There's definitely something that she's found out about that, that they definitely talk to each other. So join us to find out um, what these unseen, um, interconnected 
interconnected, um, uh, mysterious networks that lie beneath our forest alike and how they might be able to influence um, us in the future and, um, and help us. Um, so uh, don't forget that you can uh, keep up to date with everything um, about the diff on diff.co um, and tweet uh, uh, on hashtag uh, think diff. Um, and just to show that not everything in the world is high tech, I know that we're talking about that in the Disruptive Innovation Festival, but here is my colleague Molly um, earlier today using a very low tech uh, solution to trying to uh, solve an audio problem. So with that, I'll leave you and hand back to Lucas and what is uh, turning out to be a really engaging conversation. Thanks, Lucas. Thank you very much, Joe. Um, coming back to you, uh, I would like to uh, quickly, just a question from uh, internet, from Sarah. Um, how might a virtual re reality be used in education? We started this the discussion, and uh, Sophie, please uh, elaborate a little bit on that. Sure, it's a, it's a great question. It's actually, I think, a very important one too, because it's all very well to use VR in gaming and whatever else, but actually there are some tremendous, you know, very impactful ways we could use it. And Google already is actually using um, I think it's called Google Journeys or Google Adventures, and I, I forget the exact name of it, but they've handed out their cardboard viewers, if you've seen those, that's just a cardboard headset that you slot a, a phone in the front of that you can just get on Amazon for $9 or whatever it is. Um, and that will take you to the pyramid, it takes you, you know, to whatever apps are in that experience and, and, and obviously gives an incredible new layer um, of experience to, to people learning in ways that obviously um, is almost impossible to do. And we, you talked earlier, um, Lukash, about, about bringing these technologies to markets that wouldn't have been able to experience them in the past. I think cheap um, VR experiences are an incredible way to bring very, very high quality education um, at scale. And I think that's a really important opportunity. The next, uh, actually, the next slide that I have um, um, here, oh, there's my, uh, there's my, my Rory Sullivan um, uh, video. The, this is a really sweet app that I actually saw on, on the Oculus um, Rift, which is the headset that's owned by Facebook. And it's called the Museum of Stolen Art. And I love this concept. And when you talk about education, I think this sort of thing is very important. It's essentially a gallery that's filled with um, paintings that have been stolen. And so it's impossible to visit this gallery in real life because it doesn't exist. But it, it actually collates all the different stolen paintings that are, I don't know, under people's beds or in bank vaults or in wherever they might be around the world into a gallery experience that you can see artworks that you'd, never, you'd literally never be able to see in real life. So not just because you can't make it to Paris to go to the Louvre, but actually they, they aren't, they don't, you know, they're not in, on public view anywhere. I think that's an incredible, really creative way to use virtual reality, which I think should be used to create experiences that we don't already have rather than just copy what we already have because so i think a lot of vr experiences like go to the maldives on a vacation or you know go to the pyramids or whatever but we know we know those already what we can't do and can't see yet are extraordinary experiences like in deep space or stolen art or i don't know we don't have to you don't have to obey the laws of gravity of course in virtual reality so we could do some really quite extraordinary things yeah, well, that's 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 really great. I'm I'm super fascinated about it, and like, but actually, I would like to know. You know, this is this may be a little bit a controversial topic. Like, oh, but I would prefer eventually to go to this museum by myself. Like, you know, like how to kind of encourage people and let's say yeah. sell it uh, to 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 the uh, to the audience that this is actually yeah. a great thing that provide you so many different opportunities and as you said like um, you will even be able to um, see more but I would like to a little bit elaborate on the on on the kind of um, you know thing that you can actually be there and touch things and like where where do you think that will go so you're talking about the ability to be able to, to feel and and have other sort of senses yeah. um, stimulated in VR yeah. rather than just sight yeah yeah. So obviously, I mean, again, it, it's the early days, but what they call haptic technology, so that's like feedback technology. So you'd, you, if you were touching something, you would feel that sensation and they can, use, they can they're using ultrasound, they're using all kinds of different experimental technologies to see how we're going to feel um, these products. So say we're in virtual shopping, how will we pick something up and feel it and understand what the texture of that material might be or whatever else. And, you know, all I can say is it's been, work, it's been worked on by a lot of different um, people. Um, but I think, again, it's, it's all part of the fact that I believe that content that we currently experience online, whether that's watching Netflix movies or whatever, we're going to, we're going to 
see content into the in the future as something we don't just watch, but we feel and we smell and we experience in a in a in a more kind of holistic way rather than just sight. Um, yeah, I've seen like, some wonderful uh, examples of that where they've blown wind in your face so you can feel like you're flying and you can, you know, there are smells, you can smell the, the ocean as you're flying over the ocean. And, and it's, you know, real, it's all very experimental still there. Yeah, that's, that's actually what I wanted to ask you about. Like, uh, this probably will, all these new technologies will have huge impact on how we actually shop, how we buy things, how we, uh, how we, and you know, this, this border between uh, being in the shop and being in the home, like how we do our shopping. Like, can you please tell about that a little bit more? Absolutely. I mean, currently, obviously, there's no, there's no transaction experience in VR. So when you're, you're roaming around, you know, a store or whatever in, in 3D, which, you know, is just beginning to start now, um, in terms of, again, experimentation only, there's, you know, I think it's highly unlikely that we'll then take off our headset, pick up our iPad, and then buy that thing, you know, online. I, I think it's almost inevitable that that transaction experience will be part of that, um, that virtual world or that augmented world um, that we live in and just doesn't exist yet. I also think to your point about data and personalization earlier, you know, it, it would seem very surprising to me if the whole VR experience wasn't tailored specifically to you. So they say that in the future, you know, virtual stores, every store will be your favorite store because it's it's designed for you, for all your your whims and your likes and your uh, your preferences in a way that obviously physical retail isn't today. But I think it's really important to bear in mind that we will still, I believe anyway, personal opinion, but I think that we will we will want human experiences as much as we'll want virtual experiences because by and large most of us are pretty social creatures who enjoy hanging out with other humans and i don't think like that guy talking to his daughter you know virtually i don't believe that that replaces him talking to her but it's a far better version than just a phone call so I mean. sophie i have i we have five, five more minutes and i have two more questions uh i really like this the next one uh this is from alicia and she's asking, like, will we eventually holiday in virtual reality? Yeah, it's a great question. And I always, I give, I give a bit of a, a sort of, um, uh, I suppose, a, a double answer to that. So I, uh, I used to have on a, on a cardboard viewer um, an app from the company North Face, uh, if you know, it's outdoor wear. And they had a wonderful experience in VR where you would go to the Grand Canyon and you could just walk around and there would be people climbing up, you know, um, uh, abseiling and jumping off cliffs and everything else. And I, I used to love it. I used to love that experience because it was, it was always like meditating. I could just pop the goggles on, go to, go to the Grand Canyon for a few minutes. Um, and I used to feel very relaxed. It was like meditation at work. And I always say that I don't believe that's, that's, that it means that I'm never going to go to the Grand Canyon because obviously I can't go to the Grand Canyon in my lunchtime. Like I work in central London. It's not something that replaces my experience of, of going on holiday there. I think it might even make me want to go to the Grand Canyon rather than say, well, I've already done it. So I don't think it's like a zero sum game. That's so I think we will actually experience some of this stuff, but I don't believe that it, it, it replaces. It might be the way we choose hotels because we can go and look around it first before we go and stay in it. But I don't believe that means we won't go and stay in it. And that's actually kind of, there's a link between uh, this previous question and the next question yeah. from Molly, uh, which is asking, who is asking, will virtual reality simply will recreate the real world around us? Well, I, I think it probably will in the sense that I think we'll probably recreate much of the physical world for education purposes, for retail, for whatever else. But I hope that we don't limit it to that. Because I actually think that the exciting things in VR aren't limited to the, the, as I said, the laws of physics that we have to obey when we're roaming around the, this planet. And I actually think that there's a tremendous um, potential to do really, really exciting stuff. But, you know, like, I don't know, join a protest. Uh, it's a bit of a, a controversial thing to say about perhaps today, but, you know, if I wanted to go and protest somewhere, anywhere in the world today, I could maybe go and join that in VR in ways that I couldn't um, in, real, in real life. So I hope that it actually becomes a little bit more creative than just re recreating um, the real world. Sophie, I have to say that all these technologies you are talking about are absolutely amazing. Uh, we received lots of um, questions and uh, we, sp we could spend uh, another uh, couple of hours just answering yeah, uh, these questions. Yeah, yeah definitely. Uh, well, thank you very much uh, for, um, for your time and uh, that you joined us today. Uh, and well, 
uh, thank you very much for all your questions. Don't forget uh, to uh, click feedback button to let us know what you thought about this session. And also I would like to invite you to our next sessions, um, which is about green building. Thank you very much for now.